All right, uh, let's, let's get started. Um, let me start with a recap from the last episode of this series, this mini-series, right? So last time on, you know, tropical Hurwitz numbers, um, we defined Hurwitz numbers, and if you want, like the whole hour was about defining Hurwitz numbers in many different ways, depending on what's your favorite flavor of mathematics, right? So if you're a complex analyst, get out of here. I mean, uh, then <laughs> Hurwitz numbers are the number of maps or Riemann surfaces, right? If you're a topologist, then for you, Hurwitz numbers are counts of numbers of ramified covers between topological surfaces. If you're a group theorist, you might want to say that you're counting monodromy representations, which are just group homomorphism from the fundamental group of a functional surface into the symmetric group. And if you're a representation theorist, you might be wanting to say that you're computing the coefficient of a particular product of elements in a class algebra of the symmetric group. And why is that something that a representation theorist does instead of a group theorist? Uh, well, maybe they both do it, but, but the class algebra of the symmetric group is really something that has this beautiful structure of being a semi-simple algebra, but the change of basis that makes the, the product really transparent has to do with the character table of SD. So it's really intrinsically saying that knowing all Hurwitz numbers is an equivalent thing as knowing all characters of all symmetric groups. Right. Um, cool, so that is what we did yesterday. Hopefully it feels vaguely familiar. Are there any questions before I move on to today? Going once, going twice, moving on. All right, so today we're going to talk about Hurwitz numbers and moduli spaces, right? So moduli spaces are, are certainly like something that's very important in, in, this, in this summer school. But I want to spend maybe the, the first, you know, hopefully no more than 10 minutes, sort of repeating some of the things that both Hannah and Drew said in their first lectures so that they're all sort of, you know, put together in a way that, that will make the, the second half, well, the second, third and third third of this lecture um, hopefully flow naturally, right? So I want to do a quick discussion of a number of geometry, right? So like, like, Hannah said yesterday, right, enumerative geometry studies question the form, how many geometric objects of a certain kind, of a certain type, satisfy a collection of geometric requirements. Okay. Question mark. Right, and as an example, right, so I think question question number two, right, is how many conics in P2 satisfy the, co the condition of passing through five points in P2. Okay. And a, a strategy sort of a modern strategy to answer these kind of questions is to create a moduli space for objects of a certain type, this thing, and each requirement Each requirement you want to impose, right, becomes a sub-variety. So these are the objects 
satisfying. The ith requirement Okay, so M is a space whose points are in bijection with all the objects you care about. The objects that satisfy a particular requirement will be a subset of this space or a sub variety, if you're lucky. And then if you want to impose multiple requirements, you're just intersecting the sub varieties. Right? And then if you're lucky, you can compute the answer, right, is the cardinality of the intersection of all these ri's. Okay? And so this strategy in example two is that there is a P5 is a moduli space For conics, inside P5, I have a hyperplane HP corresponds to all conics that pass through the point P. Hyperplane of conics through a point P in P2. And if I intersect if I in intersect five general hyperplanes in P5, I get exactly one point. Which again, you can translate this further to just a linear algebra problem if you want, right? So this is how a numeric geometry gets translated to a question of intersection theory on a moduli space. And then once you have a question of intersection theory, you're, fra you're far from being done, but then you can unleash other techniques. OK? Cool. So far, so good. So next, I want to talk a little bit more about you know, what we want, or what we want to see, or what we want to sort of observe in a moduli space, and this is going to be, again, repeating some of the things that Drew said both um, Monday and today, and I want to actually, it's, it's good to revisit an old friend, so I'm pretty sure that everybody thinks of projective space as an old friend. Am I correct? Does anybody not like projective space? No, good, that's the right answer. Okay, so I mean, we all think we like projective space. Most of us have seen projective space, if not from undergrad, at least from, you know, first few classes of grad school, right? I remember in Italy, we're kind of obsessed with algebraic geometry because we think we're good at it. Uh, we were 100 years ago, and now we're okay, right? And so we have undergrad courses in, in algebraic geometry where they start by telling, you know, projective, the projective plane is a plane plus a line. The line is an infinity, right? We, causes you to wonder is like, well, well, what does that mean? Where is that line, right? And then you keep revisiting this, and every time it feels a little bit better. Um, so hopefully, like, I'm going to tell you something about projective space that you probably already know, but you don't know you know, right? So let me start with a vector space V. Right? And let me say that projective space, in fact, what I really want to talk about is the projectivization of this vector space V, right? is a moduli space for families of one dimensional linear subspaces of B. Okay, so far so good, right? So in particular, what this means is that the set of closed points of P of V is naturally in bijection with one-dimensional 
linear subspaces of B. Okay. But this right now is just sort of a, a set theoretic statement, right? So what makes this set into a space and what makes this set, in, set into a modular space and how does this family's business come into like you know into play, right? And the way that I like to motivate this is that over P of V, well, well, first of all, I can I can do something rather silly, which is I can look at the product space P of V cross V, and then I have a natural projection down, right? But inside this P of V cross V, I have something that I want to call the universal family over P of V, which means that it's some space that lives inside here with a map, a surjective map down to P of V, with a property, if I, if I take any point, and so what do I want to call this? I want to call this point um, big L for linear subspace, right? So a point in projective space is an you know, a linear subspace. If I look at the inverse image of this point, the pi, right? So pi inverse of L, this is exactly L comma L. In other words, this is some space such that for every point of projective space, on top of it, I see precisely the objects that that point wants to talk about. Okay, so that's a universal family because P of V, its points corresponds to lot to one-dimensional vector subspaces of V, but there is actually a natural object that puts all these spaces together and gives it a nice geometric structure. In fact, this is a line bundle over P of V, right, which is all, all often called O P of V of minus one. So far, so good. So being a space rather than just a set means that one way to make it into a space is I made into a space the set of all objects that I want to parameterize. Okay. The fact that this is even better than that, it's a modular space for families, is captured by the fact that if I have any space B, together with a line bundle over B, which naturally embeds into B cross B. Right? So if you want a line bundle that sits inside the trivial bundle of dimension dimension of B, okay, then I can obtain L by pullback by a fiber diagram. Right. So there is a natural map from B to P of V given by L. Why? I'm sorry, maybe L is not a good L because that's L, so cur let's curly L it. Right? Because for every point of B, the inverse image here is a linear subspace. Let me call it LB. But LB identifies a point here, and so I know where to send the point little b, so I get a function here. And now, now that I have a function here, I can take the fiber product between these two things, and I recover exactly L uh, to isomorphism. Let me shove that on the right. Okay. And so these are the kind of things, this is the kind of dictionary that I want to exploit when I study a moduli space, 
right? I want to say every time I have a family of my favorite objects, I get a map into the moduli space. And really, when I'm really lucky, every time I have, well, one, one direction is one there and luckier. But let me say, I want both. Every time I have a map, I get a family of objects. Questions so far so good? Was this a completely natural ready to everybody or slightly, slightly not na completely natural, right? Not, I mean, at least the first couple times you see projective space, maybe you don't think about this, right? Um, something that you see right away, but again, I'm... We haven't, we've done everything somehow coordinate free, right? Now choose a basis, right? Choose a basis for V, and what do you get? This is something that I was telling somebody on the way to the brewery. I, I tried to make my engineering students in linear algebra at CSU understand for a full semester and we all hated each other at the end of the semester. <laughs> but, but hopefully you're more, you know, uh, an audience that could be more convinced. You choose a basis, you get a bunch of things, right? First of all, you get a coordinate systems. A V, which really means it's getting an isomorphism to some C to the M plus one, right? But if you get a coordinate system, and if you agree that there's one complex number which is the specialist of complex numbers, namely zero, right? Then you get a, you know, a coordinate hyperplane arrangement in C to the m plus one. And sorry, I should probably say you get a coordinate system of V, I should fit in here, that you get a system, a homogeneous coordinate system for P of V. Right? Because now you can take the coordinates of C to N plus 1 as, as identifying points in P of V, but obviously a single point in, sorry, there's infinitely many points in CN plus 1 that will identify the same point. C, so that's why it's a homogeneous coordinate system. We have a coordinate hyperplane arrangement in C to the n plus 1, which produces a stratification on P of V. Right? In other words, there is an equivalence relation that you can put on points of projective space that is how many, no, not only how many, but which coordinate hyperplanes do you belong to? Right? And if two points belong to the same set of hyperplane um, coordinate hyperplanes, then you make them equivalent. That's an equivalence class. And equivalence class partition a set. And so you get like a partition of your projective space. Right? And this produces right, the, the picture that now we've been seeing a bunch of times of, for example, P. That's capoeira. <laughs> of P2, having one sort of two-dimensional equivalence class or one two-dimensional stratum, right? And this open stratum, we often want to think of it as this is the interior of the moduli space. Okay, so in, in other words, you want to think of, you know, you've chosen these coordinate hyperplanes, right? And, you know, being on a coordinate hyperplane means, you know, living dangerously, right? It means being special with respect to some 
coordinate. And so the, the most of the points in your moduli space, they're like good citizens that don't want any trouble, right? And that's, that's the interior of the moduli space, right? And then there's the, you know, the, the kids that like, you know, they, they break this one rule, right? Have one coordinate being zero, and that's going to mention one. And then there's, you know, those that break two rules, and so on and so forth. And somehow, like, you know, this is what Drew was calling being deeper and deeper into the stratification, right? And the cool thing about this stratification is that each of the, each of the closure of this strata is itself a projective space. Right? So, you know, this closure of this one red stratum, so you include these two points, it's a P1. Right? So the boundary is not only like made up of smaller and smaller stuff, but it's made up of smaller and smaller projective spaces with natural embedding maps into the original space. Okay? So these are, so there are, oops, yeah. So the, the complement of interior is called boundary. And the boundary is made of smaller projective spaces included into P of V by embeddings. And so this is the kind of structure that we want to observe in many moduli spaces. When we're very lucky, we'll get a structure like this. And this is a structure that gives hope to tackle a number of geometric questions in some sort of recursive way. Because if you have some question that is some intersection problem of some moduli space, but somehow you can use some equivalence relation to push it to the boundary, then the boundary when you push when you push it to the boundary, if you're lucky, you will have similar questions, but on smaller projective spaces or on smaller moduli spaces or moduli spaces with smaller invariants. And then what do you do? Well, then you rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, and ho until hopefully you've pushed the question to spaces that themselves are simple enough that you can answer the question. But then what's the pri the price that you paid? You've you've rinse and repeat a bunch of times, so you have combinatorics to deal with to reconstruct the original answer from these atomic rings. Okay? So there is, there is this kind of cool interplay between kind of geometry and combinatorics, right? Like you want to simplify the geometry, the price to pay is to complicate the combinatorics, so that's, then when that's why you have to make combinatorialist friends that help you like organize the combinatorics. Questions, comments? All good? Do you love projective space even more now? Oh, okay. I see at least, at least a couple people saying yes, so oh, it's good. Just, just kind of setting up the general framework for what I would want from a Yes, yes, because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take like an infinite step in sophistication. You're going to say, now that you understand projective space, let's talk about relative stable maps, right? Um, but the reason I know I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time here because, I mean, let's be honest, right? Even those of us that we say, well, we love MGN bar, right? But do we really understand MGN bar? As in, like, could you find a point in MGN bar which is not special? And the answer is no, right? Could we actually describe, you know, local coordinates and an atlas and charts and tracing functions? And the, the answer is no, right? So. What we do in mathematics is we try to milk a lot of information out of the very little we understand of a space, right? And so for this moduli space theory, you, you know, this is kind of, if, if you have a stratification like this, it's both a fairly simple-minded thing because you break up something you don't understand into things that you still don't understand, <laughs> but you don't understand them a little less, right? 
Um, and it, I mean, this is a remarkably, like you can actually get remarkably a lot of mileage from just this, this, this process, right? And so the next thing I'm going to do is, is I want to put on the board a bunch of moduli spaces that we will care about, you know, for talking about Hurwitz numbers. Um, and if you feel like, okay, I, I, I really don't understand these things, um, it's okay. The thing that I want you to sort of at this point appreciate is there's, there's going to be some open set parameterizes some generic objects, you know, the, the obj objects that don't live dangerously, right? And then there's going to be some, you know, way to add some points corresponding to obje objects that live progressively more dangerously, right? And that these objects that live progressively more dangerously can be expressed somehow in terms of simpler objects, right? So that's, that's really what I need you to sort of buy into in order to be able to follow a lot of the things that we'll talk about for the rest of the course. So let me introduce some, some good friends. Here are some moduli spaces we love, or we should love, right? So the first one I claim maybe should be M0n, right? And this is a moduli space for equivalence classes of n-tuples of distinct points of P1. And the equivalence relation is that an n-tuple P1 Pn is equivalent to Q1 Qn if and only if there exists an automorphism of P1, so a phi in PGL2, such that phi sends each of the PIs into the corresponding QI. And this can be described pretty explicitly, can be put in a pretty natural way as an open subset of an affine open subset of a n minus 3. Not canonically, not in just one way, in fact in many possible ways, as you can probably see by the fact that I have an index n here and n minus 3 here, so there's I'm doing something that choose that that singles out three points so maybe be a little bit special, right? But, but this is a moduli space that we understand very well. This is a moduli space which is non-compact. And in fact, in a sense, the fact that I'm keeping all the points distinct means that I'm, this is only sort of interior. There's no bad behavior that these points can have. Right? So what's the bad behavior the points could have? They, well, they, could come, they, they, they might want to come together and party. Right? They might want to come and coincide. And so how to deal with that gives rise to sort of possible compactification of M0n. Right? So let me put a couple that we will care about. So one is M0n bar. Right? So in M0n bar, so points have to remi remain distinct.
But curves, instead of just P1, may become nodal rational curves. Right? So an example of a nodal rational curve is Mickey Mouse, right? Uh, and points are distinct on Mickey, P1, P3, P2, P4. Let me stop here for now. But I'm going to ask something else, first of all. Points, I'm not going to allow them to be at nodes. So let me say n smooth. So let me just say, let me put a bad Mickey here. I have a point here. Bad, bad Mickey. Okay, no. Okay. And one more thing I'm asking is that um, the automorphism of these objects are finite. And what is an automorphism? The object is going to be a map from the rational, from a map from Miki to itself that preserves the points. Okay. And this, because we know the automorphism of P1 as being given by PGL2, and they, you know, once you have, you're asking to fix three points in a more atmosphere, this translates to a combinatorial condition that says that you should have three special points for every component, which again, in this case, I stop short of doing that. So let me add a couple more, P5 and P6. Okay. And now this is a stable Miki, right? And this is a very unstable Miki because All of my component actually do not have three special points, right? So it's it's a Mickey that's automorphism all around, right? So find it. Okay. And m bar zero n is a moduli space, which is very very nice in the sense that it has a stratification by where the codimension of a stratum, sorry, I should say by and complete the sentence, a stratification by homeomorphism classes of objects parameterized, which really means I want to say how the bubbles are attached and which points each bubble supports. And the codimension of the strata is given exactly by the number of nodes. Each node you form is one more sort of way of living dangerously that these objects uh, have found, right? So, you know, if I look at the set of all possible curves that consist of a sphere with two other spheres attached, and on the face of Mickey I have point P1 and P3, and on one of the years I have P2 and P5, on the other year I have P4 and P6, the set of all such configurations gives me a set of points that will be a codimension 2 stratum in what I'm going to call m bar 0, 06. Okay. And so on and so forth. Right. And we, I mean, we'll come back to this. I think Hannah will come back to this. So let me, right now what I want to do is I just introduce a few, a few of these moduli spaces a little bit quickly. But is there anything like? confusing at this point about this. Yeah? Do you have any wires in the dimension table? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a dimension count. Like the, the, the simpler things that, I could, that, that, that you could do to make it formal is <coughs> just actually, comp you know, in, in fact, thank you. Because one, one thing they should have said, right, is that this, the locus of all points right here, you can think of it as being given by, well, give me a configuration of three points on this year and three points on this year 
and four points on the face and then tell me what to glue and then you get a point in here, right? So the closure of this locus is really an m bar 0, 3 times m bar 0, 3 times m bar 0, 4. And once you know the dimension, you can like actually compute the dimension of these things and you'll see the co-dimension is 2. That's the easiest way that I can think of making it formal. Intuitively, you should think that you know, forming a node corresponds to like points coming together. And points coming together is a co-dimension 1 condition. So every node that you form, you have a bunch of points that have you know, come and parted, and that's a co-dimension 1 condition. Cool. Any other question? Questions are always good. Insults, not so much, but questions are good. OK, good. So let me. Question, maybe just one comment. Question or insult? Oh, comment. Insult. Great, good. <laughs> insult. Um, uh, no, just because, we, because main thread keeps coming up. Oh, yeah. It's worth pointing out that there's a main thread hiding in the background here. It's the complement of n theorem is this arrangement of hyperplanes. Uh, and that's the, yeah, that's the braiding. Yeah. Main thread is supposed to be the complete Or the one associated with the complete graph in n minus 1 that's points. Right. Minus 1 bits. By the Romans, Concini, yeah. Procesi. Yeah. Anyway, Matt will be happy to answer any question you have about that, right? <laughs> cool. Um, let me, so this is one, this is 1 1.3, 1.6. Example 1.6 is M0. W, so one variation that you could say, so, so this is a situation in which point can never really come together, right? If, if points want to come together, then what you do is you, is you create a new world for them, and you put them in this world, but you know, stay apart, right? So you could think of this as you know, somehow like it's, it's, it's a, a way to make something infinitesimal finite in such a way that when these two points want to kind of collide, you don't let them. Right? But you could do some sort of hybrid situation in which you say, well, I want to let some points actually collide and party and some others not. And one way to control this is I'm going to give some weights to each of the points. And I'm going to say when points want to party, right, if they reach a certain critical mass, I don't let them because they're too loud. The neighbors complain. So I actually sprout out a new bubble and put them there. But if they're just you know, a few light points coming together, that's no problem, right? So these are what's called Hassett spaces. So let me, so this is Hassett space of weighted stable curves, right? So this is, again, nodal rational curves. Then um, still finite number of automorphism. And points can collide only if the sum of their weights is less than or equal one. So let me again do an example of a weighted stable Mickey and maybe a not stable Mickey. Right, so for example I could have P1 that has weight one fourth coincide with P2 that has weight one third and then P3 has weight 1, and P5 has weight 1 as well. And oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill one of the years of Mickey. There we go. 
Oh, but now, yeah, now it's unstable. Crap. Let me put another point here. P. Six, one, two. Oh, I, I skipped P4. P4 has weight one. Okay. So what has happened here, right? Um, I've given weight one fourth and one third to P1 and P2. Right? And um, yeah, sorry, I, I missed the bullet point, but I'll say it in a second. Um, and so P1 and P2 now, if they want, they can, they can come together. They can sit on top of each other. Right? Um, but the one thing that I forgot to say is that also on any component, the sum of the weights of the points plus the number of nodes should be strictly greater than 2. Okay? And so here, I have 1, 2, plus 1 fourth, plus 1 third, so this component is stable. I have 1 plus 1 plus 1, 3, so this component is also stable. Okay? And these two, these two conditions are, you know, are not independent of each other. They're obviously clearly fine-tuned, that they can be sort of nicely replaced by the numerical condition on the, on the relative dualizing sheaf of this thing, but I don't want to get technical at this point. But again, an example of, of a Mickey which is not stable, not weighted stable, is if I put P1 and P2 with weights 1 half and 1 third here, because now this bubble has 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third, that's less than 2. So this should not be here. This should actually collapse, and these two points should be on top of each other. And something also, so this is bad. And something which is also bad is I could have P3 equals P4 and have both of them weight 1. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you want to set it up, set up the good, the moduli space sort of in an algebraic, geometrically honest way, the way Brendan Hassett did, then you make the weights rational because then they correspond to some kind of Q divisors on the universal family and it sort of makes sense how to construct the, the moduli space in the universal family by GAT. But from a purely sort of combinatorial perspective, you can let the weights be whatever you want. You know, I mean, real in any sense, right? But, but it makes sense to have the weights be between zero and one because after one, it really doesn't matter. Like they're one is infinitely heavy in a sense. Right? And that's it. And again, there's a rich theory. Maybe Vance will tell you something about it. Um, you know, every single one of these things I'm putting on the on the on the board, I'm resisting the temptation of getting completely sidetracked and speaking for the rest of the hour about it. So again, let me just ask any any confusion so far? Uh, because, because of how I tune these conditions, after your weight one, you're essentially infinitely heavy. It doesn't really matter. Right? Oh, except, I mean, except for the point of having one point on a, okay. That's not important, let me just say. <laughs> let me just say that it doesn't matter, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's this annoyance be because of uh, this, this is a strict inequality, right? So you can say, like, yeah, if you give a, this second condition, if you have just one point on a bubble with one node, if you make weight greater than one, that becomes stable. I don't want that. I also don't want to think about it, but uh, yeah, it's not important. It's probably the kind of thing that is. It, it, it so, but this will not by the contract of the automorphism. By what? Sorry? It would be ruled out by the finding of automorphism. That's that's correct. Yeah, yeah. But it, I mean, okay. It's it's extremely unpleasing to have to invoke the finding of automorphism. But you're right. Yeah. So if I, 
yeah, unless you it's, it's just save me, right? The one thing I was worrying about, I shouldn't worry about because it's ruled out by this thing. So I go back to what I said before is that if the weight is beyond one, you get exactly the same thing as weight one. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Anything else? Good. So from here we go from 1, 1 1.3, 1.62, right, of course is mgn bar, right, which is now sort of same thing, but you allow curves to have genus. Okay. So still only nodal singularities, still all the points are distinct, but no longer just P1s, which means that now all of a sudden, whereas this was a purely sort of combinatorial problem in a sense, because I have only one complex structure on P1, this becomes an infinitely more sophisticated geometric problem. Because genus G remains surfaces have complex structures. Okay? But nonetheless, this comes with a nice you know, stratification, again by topological type. Right? So now, for example, Mickey Mouse got a bun bunch of piercings. Okay. And this example of a stratum of codimension 2 inside M3 bar. Okay. Or Mickey Mouse could put a hat on it, its ears with a point. And then it would be M41. And now this is a stratum of dimension 4. OK. Great. Next friend. Three. Yeah. Right. So the numbers can be negative. The no what numbers can be negative? No, no, the weights. So uh, I mean, I could. I mean, it becomes singular. I, I haven't said anything about being nice enough, right? But. You could, you could do zero. That, that becomes sort of like some, has to do with symmetric quotients and stuff like that. But um, yeah. Cool. I want to beeline a little bit. So the reason I'm introducing all these spaces is because we're going to be using them, right? So why should one care about something like this? Well, Hassett did for some reasons, right? If you want to do Hervis theory, you might care for some other reasons. So Let's get there by introducing like the most relevant space for Herbert theory, which is the Herbert space, right? So Herb, uh, H to G, degree D, R, and all your etas, right? And this is a space. This I should think of it as the analogous of M zero N for Hurwitz theory. So everything here is going to be smooth, nice, non-degenerate, right? Um, in fact, let me keep this a little bit simple. Let me get to zero. These are going to be parameterizing maps, I can even say G, from genus G, Riemann surfaces, to P1 of degree D such that I have some points here over which I have ramification profile given by the etas. And some other points here where I have ramification profile 
which is just simple. So d minus 1 inverse simple. So what's changing with respect to the picture that I drew when I said the Hurwitz number is the number of discovers? When I wanted to count the discovers, I had pinned these points down on P1. They could not move. Now in this space, these points can move around. Right? So now, now all of a sudden, I don't have a finite number of discovers if I believe the Riemann's existence theorem. Because if I move these points around, topology doesn't notice. So if I have a particular ramified cover, with a configuration and a move, a wiggle a, a point a little bit away, still I get a ramified cover, right? But Riemann existence theorem tells you, aha, you've changed your complex structure now a little bit, and so that's probably a different Riemann surface and a different cover, right? So now I have a continuous space of ramified covers, okay? And again, I can I can think about it how to sort of compactify it. Right? And I can com compactify it in a couple of different ways. One which is called the admissible cover compactification, which is similar to n bar 0 n, except that really what we should be thinking about is that this point, the point, you know, in m, m bar 0 n, if points want to party, you like put them on a different universe, right? So here we, we should think about branch points. If branch points try to like come together and party, then you should sprout out another rational curve, bring them out here. But then you also want to degenerate correspondingly the cover, right? So the objects in here are covers. And maybe there's one more here. These are covers of nodal rational curves, right? But over each component, I have a degree d cover, possibly disconnected, right? And I still have all my branch points that I had before, p1 dot, dot, dot ps, and the q1, q2 dot, dot, dot qr, right? All the branch points with their ramification profiles, three and four, are still there. Six. And distinct. Okay. And the way you should think about this is really like if these points determine a monodromy representation that identifies this cover, then these points somehow they have group elements of the symmetric group attach themselves. So if you now like break them into subsets, they will each determine another monodromy representation for this particular subpart, and so they'll determine covers here. Okay. One last thing that I should mention about this situation is that over these nodes, you have only nodes, right? And the ramification profiles on either side of the nodes should be the same. Right, so if I have a triple, if I look on this left-hand side of this cover and I see a triple point here, a w equals z cubed, then it should be the same if I look on this side. And again, this is the first time you're seeing this. It might feel a little bit weird, but let's talk about it in the afternoon, right? The other compactification 
that I want to talk about. It's what's called relative stable maps. And the, the philosophy of relative stable maps is that you actually select a certain number of branch points in the base that you call, that you want to think of as special. And so for this point, they're not allowed to party with anybody else. And so if anything tries to mess with them, you do the admissible cover sort of trick. But then there's a bunch of points that you don't care about. And so these points are free to come together, and all sort of garbage is free to happen above them. Right? So in a sense, this is similar to this. Right? So let me, again, just do like one simple example where maybe I've decided that my red, this is not necessary. I could choose some, some of my blue points to be special, but let's pretend I've decided my red points to be special. Right? And so I have my P1 and my PS, and maybe some blue point had tried to kind of go and poke PS, and so I sprouted out something else, right? So then now my blue points are here. But I could have a bunch of blue points that have all come together here, right? And so what I want to see is a map of degree d over this component, a map of degree d over this component, the right ramification profile over my red points. But over this kind of mess of blue points that have come together to party, anything could happen, including I could have a contracted component if I want. So long as the total genus of my curve is the right one. And so these are two compactifications of the Hurwitz space that have very distinct advantages. This one is a smooth compactification in an orbifold sense, so I really like it for this reason. Um, this has a, you know, if, if I choose exactly two points to be special, it has a very nice um, formula as a cycle in the Chow ring, and it's something that Drew will say a lot about, right? So it's, it's a good thing to, to talk about. Okay, deep breath. These are all the friends that I wanted to introduce. Any question before I have my one minute closing statement? Well, I mean, yeah, ho this is not a question I can answer in five seconds, but hopefully I'll answer in the next four hours. Uh, yes, yes, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to, um, there's a lot to answer that question, yeah. But I mean, I really hope that I can, I can get to some of it. Uh, let me just conclude really quickly by saying, okay, another question? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it depends how you're setting things up. I mean, I, I haven't really been too careful about whether I want to do the rubber space or not, if I have only two points. But um, I mean, I think you can set up things in a way that dimension is the same if you want. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about it later. I mean, th there's, <laughs> you know, even though I've hit you with like seven different variations of similar ideas, there's even more variations hidden in here that. Maybe you're thinking about something slightly different for that in mind, but. Let me just say that, so if I want to express the Herbert's number now, h g to 0 d eta, And this is a number, right? It's not a space. But one thing that I can do is actually say, well, look, there's a natural map from Herb to 
a moduli space of configuration of distinct points on P1. That if you give me this picture, I'm just going to cover this top part up, and what I see is an element of M0n. Again, I should, I should have been a little bit more honest about my equivalence relations, like Alessio was catching me on this, but you know, pretend for a second, right? Um, and so I can think of this as the degree of what's called a branch morphism from Horv to M0. And then like Druv is telling us, this is you know, a very nice sort of you know, degree of a field extension, right? But if you're like me and you hear field extension, you look for the first open window to jump out, right? And so you say, okay, um, you know, how do we tackle this? You know, this is a map of non-compact spaces. The class of a point down here is trivial and lost. Well, we need to compactify so that we can, uh, I can tackle this with intersection theory. And so these two compactification give rise to two possible ways of express, again, this is the degree, the, this branch morphism, I can look at it from a space of admissible covers to m bar 0 n, or I can think of it as the degree of, from a space of relative stable maps to some um, weighted, well, let me just call it m bar, m bar 0 w. Right? Because what is happening here, here what's happening is that, again, I can, I can delete the top part of this picture, and to every element of this moduli space, I can assign just you know, the rational curve with the branch points. And I can do the same thing here, but some of the points can coincide. And one way that, that I can model that is I can give weight to these points. Right? And so now I have you know, the, my same Hurwitz number is in three different ways a natural sort of degree of a map. And here it's a degree of a map between compact moduli, it's sort of a proper map between compact moduli spaces. So I can, in these two cases, compute this as the degree of branch upper star of the class of a point. And now in the, in, the, in the rest of the course, I'm going I'm to try to sort of like both show you how this can be done in algebraic geometry and then how this connects to tropical geometry and logarithmic geometry. Cool. Any last questions? Cool. And happy lunch, everybody.